Welcome to another edition of Anglican Voices, where we sit down and talk to people around the communion about Anglican news, sometimes legal news, uh, sometimes whatever comes up to my mind. And I have with me the canon to the ordinary, Jim Lewis from the Diocese of South Carolina. And we're going to talk a little bit about what's been happening there this summer. Um, for those who don't know, um, the diocese has been in a court case with the Episcopal Church. They went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court uh, issued a very confusing opinion. And it's a great chance that I can talk to Jim about this, um, how it affects the churches, what may be the way forward, and um, kind of the reaction coming from the diocese. First, welcome to the program, Jim. Thank you, Kevin. Pleasure to be here on Anglican TV. Thank you for the invitation. Oh, no problem. Uh, we're trying to expand uh, some of the stuff I do during the day, so when I have free time, I'm not just sitting uh, twiddling my fingers. I'm talking to fun people. Um, let's talk a little bit about the legal case. Um, you guys got a decision from the, uh, di the Supreme Court that was not what you were expecting. Um, tell me the reaction in the, within the diocese to this uh, uh, Supreme Court ruling. Uh, you're right, it was not what we were expecting. The, the trial court, as many will recall, had ruled um, entirely in our favor. The basis for that ruling had been the precedent established by the state Supreme Court in the All Saints Pauly's Island case. And frankly, that was consistent with existing legal precedent here in the state of South Carolina, that a nonprofit, which churches are, nonprofit corporation can um, choose to end their association with other bodies. And that was what um, all our parishes and the diocese did. We went through that legal process. The trial court um, agreed with the earlier Supreme Court precedent um, that everything we had done was kosher and that we had the right to, to leave and take our name and our property with us as we went. Um, basic um, freedom of religion and freedom of association. Okay. The yeah. state Supreme Court ruled back on August 2nd um, that in a very strangely, sharply divided opinion that that was not the case, that the only parishes that were able to leave and take their property um, were those that in the court's estimation had never in some way acceded to the constitution and canons of the Episcopal Church. Um, one of the many problems with that ruling is that um, the basis for that list of who succeeded and who didn't was based on a brief filed by the Episcopal Church that had no basis in the court record and even less basis in the, the facts of life. Um, St. Philip's is one of the congregations that was judged to have um, not succeeded in taking his property with it. And the only thing that St. Philip's has ever acceded to in its 300 and some odd year history is to the Articles of Religion. That's it. Well, 300 years, that would predate the Episcopal Church, the diocese. Um, and uh, you would think they would certainly have the strongest legal grounds. Let's talk a little bit about the makeup of the Supreme Court. On there um, is a judge who she is an Episcopalian uh, and her husband is in the leadership of the people fighting you. Um, when I read Facebook and some of the blogs and all the hysteria over the, the court ruling, a lot of people have been saying, Kevin, why didn't they have this, ask this judge to recuse herself? Clearly, she would have a bias for the Episcopal Church and not for the, the diocese. And I'm like, well, if I ever get the chance to ask somebody in the diocese, I'll do that. Jim, you're the victim. <laughs> Tell me why we didn't ask uh, Judge Hurst to recuse herself. Reasonable question. Um, the central answer is that there is in the state of South Carolina called something called the um, Code of Judicial Conduct. And it describes in some detail what the expected behavior of judges is in the state of South Carolina, whether you're a, you know, a, a magistrate in a local court or a justice on the state Supreme Court. And one of the requirements of the Code of Legal Conduct is that um, a judge is not supposed to rule on any case in which there is even the possible perception of bias or conflict of interest. And if such a potential conflict exists, it's the responsibility of the judge to go to the parties in the case and say, here is my possible conflict of interest 
will you waive that conflict? Well, wait, allow- okay, so that the judge is supposed to say, by the way, in case you didn't know, I'm an Episcopalian, I disagree with what you're doing trying to uh, move this diocese into the ACNA or whatever. Um, I would appreciate if you let me stay in the case, but if you don't, I, I'll respect that. That's what should have happened. Oh, boy. Uh, if the judge had abided by the Code of Judicial Conduct. Okay. And your, your example is actually a very apt one, um, one to which no one would agree to waive their rights. Um, but this was a case in which the, the judge was a member of a parish that went through a great deal of parish um, discussion about the process of disassociating with the Episcopal Church. Um, they are very much involved in this case. They were not a, a disinterested arm's length party. Um, they were a partisan, if you will, um, in the conflict. And yet with all of that baggage, um, she came to the courtroom and showed up the day of a hearing to the great surprise of many and the um, reasonable expectation legally was that uh, having you know, been there for her side, and if you've watched the videotape, it's quite apparent the degree to which she was, um, having done that, the expectation was that she would then um, do the right thing and recuse herself. Um, unfortunately, the nature of the process is um, you don't know what a judge is going to do in the state Supreme Court until A, they do or don't show up for the hearing, and then B, do or don't um, sign on the final ruling when it's released by the court. So there's no way in advance to know what they're going to do and if they're going to do the right thing. Well, but certainly part of the dynamic was that um, if you tell a sitting state Supreme Court justice that they don't know what their own code of judicial conduct says and that they're about to do something wrong, um, to make that accusation is something that um, legal counsel doesn't enter into lightly. That was also part of the considerations here. So nobody wanted to say, by the way, judge, in case you forgot, you're an Episcopalian in a church hostile to the desires. Of, okay, I, I see what you're saying. Um, but I, yeah, I, I, I've watched... You have a conflict of interest. Do you yeah. really want to do that, judge? That's all kind of insulting to their intelligence. Having watched the tape three or four times now, this will be played in law schools uh, over the country, maybe the world, for why you do ask uh, a judge. But I, I understand your thoughts, uh, at least with the decorum they have in uh, South Carolina, why not to. Um, I also, when I'm reading Facebook and other blogs and stuff like that, I'm seeing this rumor that I'll just call the, the we made an offer, you should have taken it rumor. And I, I wanted to talk to somebody about, in the diocese about that as well. Um, somebody had posted uh, somewhere early on in the discussion, well, this wouldn't have happened if you'd only taken our offer uh, of something for something. And they were kind of vague in that. And I said, well, here again, I'll write this down. And when I get a chance to talk to somebody in the diocese, I'll bring this up. Have you heard the rumor that there was an offer made by somebody of authority anywhere uh, before you guys went to trial? Uh, this has been a recurring part of the story that we have um, addressed with frequency in the press, um, the claim that the Episcopal Church made a, a settlement offer. And what needs to be understood about that offer, such as it was, um, it, it was made initially between um, legal counsel for the diocese, the tech diocese here, and one of our parish attorneys, that's how it was presented. Um, not through sort of normal channels. And when the offer was investigated, um, what our counsel did was to write to counsel for the National Episcopal Church, for the denomination, say, you're, you're the ones who have an interest, a, a property interest in this, um, so you claim. Um, we need to see your signature on this offer to know that it's really valid and binding. Um, because you can't make an offer on behalf of somebody else. The um, counsel for the local tech diocese um, can't make an offer that's binding on behalf of the national church. That's got to be by my counsel for them. Um, and when we made that request, it, it never happened. 
Um, we never got that assurance that this was an offer that they were willing to stand by. And the timing of this is important to understand. Um, the other reason why we discerned this wasn't a valid offer, um, A, it was because we never got that assurance from the other party, from the national church. Um, but the timing of it was always suspicious. The um, offer came in during the summer of 2015, just a few months before that hearing with the state Supreme Court. And the offer, um, our response to it, um, the deadline was the same day that our final brief was due with the state Supreme Court preparing for that hearing. And when we asked for an extension beyond that time um, to give the offer the consideration that it was due because there was um, only about two weeks, as I recall, um, between when it was made and when the deadline occurred, um, there was no willingness to grant us an extension beyond that date that just happened to be when our brief was due with the state Supreme Court. So the sense was, based on both those things, this was never a sincere offer. It was just a, a, a tactic, a legal tactic to distract us from what we needed to be doing at that point, preparing that brief, um, not wrangling over an offer that wasn't really an offer anyway. Well, I think uh, the legal term for that is dubious. Um, <laughs> uh, let's get back. Uh, everybody who's watching the program right now is going, well, what was the offer? What was the offer? What was, what's the offer? What did um, the people who didn't have authority to offer want you to consider? The, 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 the simplified, the essential offer was the, the parishes would be allowed to leave with their property and identities intact if we would surrender the diocese its name and assets. So for the entire diocese, the building, um, your assets, your name, your signature, bishop's seal, the, the whole kit and caboodle, they will let you have the, the churches free and clear, but nobody of authority made that offer. But nobody with authority to do so made that offer. That was the problem. Since uh, the Supreme Court decision, you guys have had some meetings with the clergy. Uh, clearly, you've probably heard from the laity. What's the feeling of the clergy uh, in response to this loss? I think it's fair to say, because it was a very unexpected kind of ruling, um, that people have been across the board in their reactions to it. And it's been something of an experience of the stages of grief and loss that many clergy are familiar with conceptually, all the different ways that people um, deal with grief and loss. And many of us have sort of cycled through those emotions. Um, and the nature of that process is it's not a sequential one, two, three, and you're done type of process. It's more like a round and around the merry-go-round until you're finally worked it all through. So there was um, anger on the part of some, especially initially, um, a certain measure of disbelief um, the sort of bargaining that's a part of that process. Um, but for some, uh, it was possible to move fairly quickly to that sense of, you know, God can redeem and use this. And I'm actually excited about the potential for walking away from my buildings and, and starting afresh with a, a clear, unvarnished, uh, unconfused gospel message. Uh, there are a lot of people in the diocese who are excited about that, both clergy and laity. But it has to be acknowledged that's certainly not universal and for understandable reasons in many cases. Uh, we mentioned St. Philip's Church earlier. Uh, we have members of St. Philip's who've been worshiping there for 12 generations. And I've talked with some of those people and they would certainly acknowledge that the, the church is not the building, it's the community of faith, it's the body of Christ. But when you've worshiped as a family in a place for 12 generations, it, it has a place in your heart and mind um, that to leave it um, is a cause for real grief and sorrow. So it will be that for many people if we do not get a rehearing from the court. So if you met with your clergy, the clergy spoke with the laity, what's the response uh, from the laity to uh, this uh, legal disaster? Well, as I said, there's a great deal of shock and dismay. Um, I think particularly involving Judge Hearn's lack of recusal, um, somewhere between um, astonishment and dismay, 
that a judge would so uh, abuse her position um, as is this case because hers is the de deciding vote in this ruling to the degree that there is a majority opinion of any sort in this case it's possible only because of um, how Kay Hearn ruled um, in her particular opinion that a, a judge in the state Supreme Court would do that is um, very disturbing to a lot of people. Since the hearing, um, the lawyers from both sides have been going back and forth, um, and you're tr going to attempt something called a rehearing. Um, there's something here that wasn't here before, uh, is, is kind of what the rehearing uh, tries to address. Um, this would be plan A. Uh, how do you think this will work? We certainly feel like there are lots of um, significant reasons for the court to um, reconsider its decision to grant us a rehearing. The most significant of those is the fact that um, Judge Hearn should have recused herself. And there are um, significant expert witnesses who have testified to the fact that um, her participation in this case really does require a, a rehearing. Um, it's not just a matter of her recusing herself now or even just of her opinion being vacated. Her participation in the ruling as it exists right now um, is problematic for the validity of that ruling. So there needs to be a rehearing for that reason, if no other. Um, but beyond that, there are some major um, legal issues that we've put in our request for rehearing that really do need to be addressed. One of them I've mentioned already, and that's the fact that there's a, a great deal of what's in this ruling that's based upon material that was um, not established as facts of the case, and in some instances, um, conclusions um, about the case that were never established at trial. Those are fairly basic kind of constitutional due process issues that the court will need to take seriously. Okay, that's plan A. What's plan B? Um, plan B, um, at least one piece of it may, if the request for rehearing and recusal is denied, we feel like because of the constitutional issues that exist in this case and the, the lack of recusal by Justice Hearn, um, both of those things are excellent grounds for um, taking our appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, it's been less than a year since the last time the current Supreme Court uh, ruled on a case where a justice did not recuse themselves when they should have. Um, this is a court that's been very interested in taking those kinds of cases. So we feel good about the potential for going down that road, even though we would rather not. Ironically, the newest Supreme Court justice is an Episcopalian and a conservative. I'm, I, we're going to have to rethink our, uh, uh, do we ask them to leave <laughs> again? I that one out. Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. Well, <laughs> that's what you pay your legal team for. Oh, <laughs> man. <laughs> All right. So, uh, obviously, um, people are going to want to know, uh, since the, the court ruling, has the Episcopal Church been in contact with you uh, to make plans for you guys to vacate the properties? Uh, no, they have not. They've been fairly clear in most of the public communications, at least, that I have seen coming out of the local diocesan office, that they understand that the legal process is not over, though they're obviously optimistic that it soon will be. Mm -hmm. So they've not reached out to us in that fashion. Um, all right. Well, this is obviously an issue that we keep both uh, sides in our prayer about. Um, I want to thank you for your time. You know, a lot of this is difficult because you had precedent on your side, you had the law on your side, you had, uh, you know, the Constitution of the great state of South Carolina and the United States of America on your side, and you, 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 we're bewildered by this. But we, we live in a world where we don't fight just people; we fight spiritual and uh, principalities, and you just like wow. Um, Thank you again. Uh, hold on, I wrote this down. Canon to the ordinary, <laughs> Jim Lewis, for your time. And thank you for joining us at Anglican Voices. Thank you, my pleasure.